Okay, folks, so we're going to talk about the importance of the dream. And just before we get into the detail of it, I want us to think about why we hear about the dream now in section three. And what we really need to remember is a word that we talked about right back at the start, and it was this idea of solace, taking comfort in something. So whenever there are moments of tension or drama in George and Lenny's lives, and, and we've come across several by this stage, what we need or what they need is to take some solace to find comfort in the, the dream, the dream that offers them hope that life will get better, that it won't always be like this. And in section one, when you had George and Lenny um, escaping from weed and George is running with the bus man, the bus driver, you had a lot of anger, you had a lot of fear, there was a lot of tension. And in order for that to dissipate, in order for that to be removed, George and Lenny talked about the dream. And now in section three, you've had trauma as well. Candy's dog and the shooting of Candy's dog, that has created a real sense of despair, particularly for Candy. But also there was there was a palpable sense of tension within the, the ranch house as they were waiting to hear that shot from Carlson. And so we've had another moment of anxiety. We've had further stress. And therefore, at this point, the dream is needed again to create the idea that there is hope and to take away some of the negativity that has emerged in section three. OK, so let's move on. OK, so if you look at the little section here where we have Lenny asking George to, to talk about the dream. Lenny feels the need to find comfort in the detail of the dream, living on the fat of the land and the rabbits. And remember, that's all the dream is to him. It's reduced down to these two things. The, the one little phrase, live off the fat of the land, which he doesn't really understand. But the rabbits, which which is the one thing that he that he's concerned with, that uh, that ability to touch soft things, to be tactile, to feel the, the softness of their fur, which in some way gives him comfort. And George then, he's not dismissing Lenny's inquiry. He feels the need to talk about it too. But the key thing is old Candy turned over slowly, his eyes wide open. He watched Ger George carefully. This is the first mention that you've had of Candy for a long time, really since he heard the shot and then turned over and faced the wall. So there's something in this potential conversation between George and Lenny that makes Candy turn over slowly, that makes him reawaken in, in that respect. And what it is, perhaps, is the hope of an escape, a way out. Um, and his eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. So he's not sure at this point, but there's something there that, that makes him realise that, that there could be the potential to, to escape from this life, from this misery. And really, when you think about it, it's an escape from the fate that, that's really sealed for him because the shooting of the dog is in some way... Um, presaging or, or foreshadowing the idea that he will be treated as callously when his time comes. So if we look at the detail of the dream, I think the clearest thing um, as we look through this section is that George and Lenny's dream is a very simple one. They just want to be self-sufficient. There is an idea that they could work together with nature to provide for themselves so they don't have to rely on anyone else. The simplicity of the dream perhaps makes it seem ever more achievable. But the idea of achieving the dream isn't anything that they, they actually grasp onto at this stage. The dream is there because it provides hope. It provides a, a, an escape, as we said earlier on, a psychological and emotional escape. They want to hear about it because they believe in it. They, they, they believe in the hope of it. They don't actually think that this is achievable. Um, it's, it's just their desire and when they think of it and when they speak of it, it does give them that idea of um, comfort. Really what it does is the words of the dream have an effect that is, that is, I suppose you could describe it as the words of the dream are like an emollient. They, they soothe away the anger and the aggression and the fear that, that came before. The idea of achieving the dream 
isn't really the important thing at this moment in time. It's believing in it, thinking about it, desiring it and hoping for it together that really gives it its power. Okay, so this is about the effect of the dream. And the first thing I want to do is just point out how it affects George. First thing there is that his voice grows warmer. Remember, <clears throat> before Lenny had asked George to talk about the dream, Lenny had been, or George had been in a really aggressive mood. He had said some misogynistic things about Curly's wife and he had talked about the idea of how his friend was now in San Quentin because of a tart. So his language was harsh, it was aggressive, it was misogynistic. But here, when he's talking about the details of the dream, just look at how it, it, you know, his voice has changed. His voice has grown warmer. So the dream has an emotional impact upon him. Um, and that emotional impact is a soothing one. Okay, it's a soothing one. The dream acts as that emollient. It, it softens George. And also, too, if you look at how physically things are changing here. His hands have stopped working with the cards. Now throughout this section three, George has been playing with the cards and he's been playing a particular card game which is called Solitaire. Now Solitaire is a one man card game. It's a card game for you to play when you're by yourself and therefore it's a card game associated with loneliness. But when we're talking about the dream, when George is talking about the dream, that loneliness starts to fade. And if you look at this section here, just how often the pronoun we is used. Because the dream is about belonging. It's about kinship and connection. And that idea that it's not something for George by himself. It's something that he and Lenny can share. It's about inclusivity. And because of that, the dream combats the loneliness and the fear of loneliness that haunts life on the ranch. So he, he no longer has to play his solitaire cards. Instead, he loses himself in this vision. But I think one of the saddest things about this is that sometimes when you think about the dream, you think about the hope of, a, of this new life. But perhaps it's not a new life. Perhaps it's trying to recapture a life that he once had. Because I think the key point here is he said, I could build a smokehouse like the one grandpa had. So... The life that he wants for himself and Lenny perhaps isn't so much a new life, but it's an ability or an, an attempt to try and recapture recapture what was once his. And that perhaps adds to the sadness of George and Lenny's struggle for this dream because um, it's not something that they, that they want because their life now is so awful but it's something that they had and lost and that perhaps links into um George's name because George is called George Milton <clears throat> and when we think about that allusion um we have the allusion to paradise lost John Milton's poem um paradise lost from the 17th century and therefore the paradise of this dream is something and, and and it's such a simple paradise the idea to be able to to look after yourself and to look after others and not be dependent on on um the authority of 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 one's boss and and know that you have a home and that you can belong in it that's his vision of paradise that's his utopia and that little reference to like the one grandpa had perhaps suggests that this is a paradise that they've lost and he wants to recapture and again it just adds to the poignancy here of of what what it is that George and Lenny want to achieve but as the dream goes on in this section um it becomes more and more i suppose developed um so the fruit that they could can and then they'd have um tomatoes and then they'd have a cow or a goat and the cream so goddamn thick you could cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon so it really is about the you know the simplicity of this life taken taken to its its highest degree cutting that life cutting uh, everything out with a big spoon so following on from that idea of a paradise lost we have another illusion um lenny provides it here with his repeated phrase we could live off the fat of the land now for lenny 
this phrase is synonymous with the dream. It, it's it's his articulation of the dream, but he doesn't quite understand it. He doesn't understand what the phrase means. He just knows that it links to his dream of living um with George and having rabbits. But we understand it for the biblical illusion that it is because it comes from the book of Genesis. And remember, we had that idea... But here you have again an allusion to what life would be like when they could return to the promised land. And you've got that with that biblical reference here. We could live off the fat of the land. It's important too that Lenny um, watched with wide eyes and that Candy watched too. So this idea that Candy is being drawn into the dream just as Lenny is, um, is something that is developing. So the, the dream and the importance of it and the beauty of it and the value of it is something that, that not only can be felt by George and Lenny, who shared it on multiple occasions, but someone like Candy understands it as as something that has the potential to offer him um, hope as well. And remember, this is a man who's been left hopeless by what has just happened to his dog. So the dream occurs just at the right time for him, at the right time for him to understand that this might offer him the possibility of escape that he that he so desperately needs. George says, we just live there, we'd belong there. And that's the key thing, we'd belong there. The idea of having one place where they belonged. And you've got here, if you look at it, you've got the repetition of that word belong. We'd belong there. There'd be no more running around the country and getting fed by a Jap cook. No, sir. We'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse. And it's that idea of belonging, of having one place that you can call your own, that is your home. And again, it's we. We'd belong there, not I. So this is a shared dream. This is a dream that is inclusive. um, And it's a dream that really is isn't it's it's really offering just what everybody wants in life that that instinctive that desire that innate understanding that you have to have a place that you can call your own that you feel that you belong that is yours um not because of not because of finances or anything like that but is somewhere that gives you solace and comfort and is your home um and that's what george and lenny and candy dream of we'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse so not have to be reliant on others but have one place that was our home and again when you think about George and his allusion that he made to his grandpa when he talked about Lenny living with Aunt Clara they had homes these are two men who had homes and because of life and because of the demands placed upon them to to find jobs, to make a living, to have a way to put food on the table. Not that they can have a table, um, but the, the idea of, of, of being profitable, being valuable in this society has taken them further and further away from their homes. And all they want to do is get back to one, get back to that idea of having their own place where they belong. And he says, maybe six, seven hours a day, we wouldn't have to buck no barley 11 hours a day and we'd put in a crop Why we'd be there to take the crop up. We know what would come of our planting. We know what would come of our planting. They would get to see the value of their own work, that whatever they do, they do for themselves, that they have a future, that we'd be there to take the crop up. They, they would have the security of knowing that that's that work that they put in. The owner is six, seven hours a day. Whatever work they did, they would do for each other and they would benefit from that. And there's a level of security there. So again, if we think about their dreams and we think about their homes, they're all underpinned by just that simple desire to be able to look after yourself, to feel that you are valued to be able to find comfort in a place that is your own and to be able to share that comfort with another person. Basic human values, basic human desires, nothing elaborate, 
everything simplistic, everything linked back to a natural way of being with others and being with the land. And then for Lenny, it all comes down to the rabbits. And rabbits, said Lenny eagerly, if you look at the adverb there, and I'd take care of them, tell how I'd do that. And then you have this this lovely, and they'd nibble and they nibble, said Lenny, the way they do, i seen them. And it's it's just the, the enthusiasm of a child and the ability to have a pet and to be able to take care of them. For for a man like Lenny, who is who depends on George every day to take care of him, um, there, there's a simple childlike joy in the ability to, to take care of his, his own little pets. So for for George, the dream is is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing that appeals to his heart and to his mind and to his body. It's about an idea of belonging and feeling um, that he as an individual has a sense of autonomy, um, that he is in control of his own destiny and that he has a value, a value that he places on himself and his own work. But for Lenny, he doesn't have that sophistication of thought. For Lenny, it's just about the rabbits. The idea to have his pets, to be able to look after them, um, which gives him his own, I suppose, in, in one sense, gives him his own wee sense of autonomy. Not that he truly understands that, but it's about the idea that he he can look after something, he can be in charge of something that he loves, he can love them and he can pet them. Again, these are all hopes for Lenny, because we know that realistically he won't be able to do that. His strength and his um, inability to control his strength means that all the little soft things that he touches, like the mouse, they die. But for, for, for the moment, for the dream, he believes that he can do it and he has hope. And it creates this beautiful childishness within him. And they'd nibble and they'd nibble, Lenny says, the way I've seen them too. And, and there's, you know, it's, it's comically childish. But again, all it does is it f- makes his innocence the most obvious thing there in that section. His innocent worldview and his innocent idea of, of how he can react and act in that worldview. George also adds to the idea of that lost paradise here. He said, and we'd keep a few pigeons and fly them around the, the windmill like they'd done when I was a kid. Again, he goes back to his past to try and create a, a, a future that's full of hope and a future that offers so much more than, than the present can. And that's so sad for George because it, he has to go back to his past to create the dream of a future. Um, he had it, he lost it, and he wants it back again. And again, I think that's the, the sadness that underpins this character. He looked rapt, raptly at the wall. Now look at that. So he's he's lost in that reverie. He's lost in that dream, and again the 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 dream. I suppose what what we have here is the idea that he doesn't believe, like he doesn't really believe that he can achieve this dream, and there's such a sadness there because he once had it. I suppose it's about trying to recapture that, recapture the the sense of belonging, the innocence, um, the idea of feeling that he was part of a, a, a group when he was a child and feeling that way again. Um, his Because his adulthood has been about separation, separation from home, separation for others, from others. And what he wants is, is to feel valued and to feel like he belongs with others and he has a place that co- to call a home where he can, where he can experience that again he says if we don't like a guy we can say get the hell out and by god he's got to do it and if a friend come along why would have an extra bunk why don't you spend the night and by god he would and so again you've got that repetition by god by god the strength of feeling the enthusiasm that he has for this image that he creates and again it's the simple image of, of being able to say who can come to your house and who can't and that tells you about about their life that they're living because the life that they're living is so bound by the the demands placed upon them by whoever they're working for that they don't even have that sense of power that they can say who can come into my room and who can't you know who, who can stay under my roof and who can't 
everything in their life currently is about being disempowered. It's about being disempowered. And what he dreams for himself and what he dreams for Lenny is to be empowered, to be an individual who can control his own destiny, control his own life. And, and ultimately, that's all that anybody wants. I think this is um, a telling little section. Lenny breathed hard. You just let them try to get the rabbit. I'd break the goddamn neck. I'll, I'll, I'll smash him with a stick. He subsided, grumbling to himself, threatening the future cat that might disturb the future rabbits. Now, if you look here, look at the vocabulary that's used here. Look at the, the words that Lenny uses. I'd break their goddamn necks. I'll smash them with a stick. So what you he have here is you have the violence of, of Lenny's diction. Now, what that tells you is, first of all, how much he loves and cares and how much he believes in these in these rabbits. It's a There's a real sadness here because the the violence of the la the language it dooms the game because what it does is articulate how violent and how inabil how unable Lenny is to control the violence that, that lurks within him. And remember that that violence is because of his his and his inability to to gauge when and where he can use his strength. But just at the point where we understand that the dream is doomed because of the violence of the language here, look at George. George sat entranced with his own picture. George is lost in it. He's lost. And there's a real sadness in, the, in this juxtaposition because what you have here is George, the rational realist, lost in the picture and the reader understanding that Lenny's language means that this dream is doomed. Because Lenny can't control his violence. You see it here in the diction that he chooses. And it's his inability to control his actions um, that will damn, the, will damn George and Lenny. It'll mean that they will never be able to recapture Paradise Lost. And it's just this lovely juxtaposition here. Where we as a reader can pick up on that foreshadowing. But George, entranced with his own picture, is lost in it. Okay, so what we have here is the first time that Candy has spoken since Carlton took his dog away to be shot. Because even though quite a lot has happened within the ranch house since then, Candy's been the forgotten man. He's been left alone with his face turned to the wall with his grief. Um, he's been isolated with his grief and with his pain. But what has happened is that the dream has... Uh, allowed him to to move away from that isolation and what it has offered him is the idea that he has a, a, that there will be a place that will offer him hope as well so his grief and his pain have isolated him but George and Lenny's discussion of the dream has provided him with a possible escape route that he can break out of that isolation and he connect, can connect with someone else and so when he speaks, um, George, I think, is very defensive. He's on his guard immediately there. And George is defensive because the dream means so much to him. Um, he needs to protect it. He knows the value of it for himself and for Lenny. And therefore, he's very possessive of it and he needs to protect it. So he's defensive because he values it. He knows its worth. And what he does here is he responds with this interrogatory sentence. What's that to you? So he's challenging and he's aggressive because he knows the value of the dream and he wants to keep it safe. But Candy does the right thing. Candy doesn't push him for more information. And instead, Candy lets George keep the secret of the dream. You don't need to tell me where it's at. It might be any place. So he's not a threat to George. He's not a threat to George's dream. And because of that... 
George relaxes somewhat. Sure, that's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. So George doesn't feel the initial threat that he did feel when, when Candy spoke because he understands he's in charge of, of the dream and where it is and where it belongs and, and it's only through him that Candy can find out of further information. So Candy actually there it lives up to his name because remember Candy is trying to be ingratiating He's trying to to worm his way in, and so he plays his cards right. He doesn't he doesn't challenge. He doesn't um he, he doesn't pry. Instead, he lets it. He lets George know that George is in charge of this information, and he can give it when he will. You know when he feels able to. When he will. The suspicion of George um carries on a little. He watches Candy suspiciously. But I think the the key thing here is that um, Candy went on excitedly. Now, if you remember, from most of Section 3, um, as soon as Carlson takes his dog outside to be shot, um, Candy is left isolated in his misery and his loneliness with his grief and despair, um, knowing that his dog has been shot. But... The dream has reinvigorated him. The dream has offered him something to get excited about. It has created this sense of vitality. Um, and that links us back to the quotation earlier where we had the idea that George's voice becomes warmer when, he's, when he speaks of the dream. So the dream doesn't just soothe, but it creates uh, vitality. It creates life. It gives the, the potential for something better. That is felt by George and is felt by Lenny. And here, with that idea of the adverb excitedly, we understand that it's it's something that's felt by Candy now too. Um, now, what you have also here is the idea of George's continuation with his interrogative sentences. Say, what's that to you? You've got nothing to do with us. And um, that idea of challenging Candy and ch challenging Candy's particular um, sense of belonging um, at this moment in time, George sees the dream as something that can only be involving himself and Lenny. He wants to separate Candy from it. Um, but that's not that's not out of selfishness, that's out of defensiveness. The idea to keep it, to keep this thing uh, for the two of them because they both value it so much. They both know it's worth. Well, when I say they both... For, for Lenny, it is just the rabbits. But George understands the weight of it. George understands its worth. He understands how, how much they both need the hope that it offers. These quotations all relate to how much Candy needs the dream um, and why he needs it as well. So we have the idea that he, that he lost his hand on the ranch and that's why they gave them a job, uh, gave them a job swamping. But we knew that because we talked about previously how much the, the brush is Candy's psychological crutch. It's what he needs to reaffirm that he's got a purpose, that he, that he has something that he can do, that he's not worthless. And remember, life in the ranch is all about what is your purpose, what can you do? Um, and with that brush in his hand, it lets him know and lets others know that he can that he can do something, but ultimately he knows that he ain't much good. Realistically, he knows that, um, and he can only do little things in the dream. I uh, in the um, if they achieve their dream, I could cook and tend the chickens and hoe the garden. But again, his dreams are simple, just like George and Lenny's. To be able to do something, to be able to have a purpose, and and to fulfill that purpose. Not just for himself, for but for others as all well, as well to cook and tend the chickens, and then he he brings in this idea. I'd make a will and shit when leave my share to you guys in case I kick off, because I ain't got no relatives or nothing. So again, it's that loneliness, that idea of of not belonging, not having a place where you are valued, and um, not having a place that you could call your own, not having that connection with another person, and that the unbelievable loneliness of that that underpins why Candy wants this dream, why George wants this dream as well because they don't have anyone and the dream offers them the, abil the ability to to have that for the first time or to recapture it but it's about that idea of connecting with another human being having a purpose and connecting with another human being and belonging The simple sentence here, they fell into a silence, is important. 
because a simple sentence, as you know, um, emphasizes something. It makes it dramatic, and really, what we have here is the the drama of of them all appreciating that this could happen. They fell into a silence. The idea that it could happen is something that is told us in three different ways. You've got the simple silence, they the simple sentence rather. They fell into a silence. Then you've got they looked at one another amazed. So you you've got the idea there that they they they're silent. Then they're amazed, and then you've got the articulation of the this thing that they never really believed was coming true. So you've got three sentences there all emphasising the impact of this dream actually being something that is attainable, that they can realise. Then George says reverently. Now, reverently means, it's an adverb that means something that's done deeply or with solemn respect, and it's usually associated with something spiritual. And what you have here is the idea that the dream and the, the, the dream is a spiritual thing for George. It's something that um that that appeals to his soul. So it's not just appealing to his mind, not just appealing to him physically, not just appealing to him emotionally, but to the it appeals to his soul, to the deep core of his being. This is this is what he wants, um, and the idea that it could happen brings it brings us here to this detail that his eyes were full of wonder. Now George is a rational realist. Ha, that's the way he's been portrayed all the way through but the idea that a rational realist can be full of wonder the enormity of actually having this hope for so very long and then thinking this can actually happen we've got the money and this can actually happen it changes him it changes him into a being that is full of wonder and what you have here is that lovely repetition he repeated softly I bet we could swing her and the the impact here is on a man who is in awe in awe of what could actually happen and that shows you how much he would want that to happen how it has been a dream for so very long and now it seems that he's on the threshold of making that dream a reality and the impact here is communi through, communicated through the short sentences the idea that a, a man such as he, a rational realist, could be full of wonder and the idea that he speaks reverently um, as if that he is undergoing a spiritual experience is something that lets us know how deeply felt this dream is for, for George and how much he wants it to happen and how surprised he is that this thing that they never really believed in could actually come true. Here we have Candy then, and Candy um, scratched the stump of his wrist, wrist nervously. Now, the dream and the connection that the dream allows him to have with George and Lenny offers him an opportunity to have um, this sort of confessional moment where he said, I got hurt um, four years ago. They'll can me pretty soon, just as soon as I can't swap out no more bunkhouses. They'll put me out in the country. Uh, maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hold the garden, even if I ain't no good at it at all. And again, this idea that Candy knows his limitations. Candy knows that he's a man who has no purpose. Just as his dog had no purpose, he has no purpose. And he knows that his fate, that his future is a bleak one, that they're going to can him, that they put him out in the country, that they'll they'll um they'll take away what little sense of belonging he has in the in the um the ranch house and they'll they'll leave him and what he wants is all or what he wants is what he wants is that idea to belong to have a purpose to feel that he can be valuable and he, he puts it so simply you'll let me hold the garden you'll let me hold the garden that's all he wants to be able to achieve something to feel that he can do something and he says but I'll be on our own place and I'll be let to work on our own place. And so we've had with the dream we, we, we. And now we've had, now we're having this development of our. So the dream is only possible when the three individuals come together. So what we have here is. 
sort of collectivism that if they come together, if individuals come together, then the dream can happen. And really, if we if we take that out of this context in relation to just achieving this farm and think about what's wrong with ranch life, what's wrong with, with the life that, that Steinbeck has created here, you have individuals who operate solely as individuals who care little for each other. You remember how the boss couldn't understand why two guys would, would, would bother with each other, why they would carry around together. So you've had individuals who only operate as individuals and the loneliness that's inherent in, in that, well, that can be challenged and that can be fought against when individuals come together, when they connect, when they realise that they have things in common and they share those things in common and those things are shared on an emotional level as well. And when that happens, so when I becomes we and becomes our, then suddenly all of the wondrous things that these individuals want can happen. Individualism, being isolated, creates loneliness and fear. Working together, being part of a collective, being part of a community, being part of a place where people belong, that allows dreams to happen. And there's a, such a sadness here because they're so very close to it. Um, and Candy says, but it'll be our own place and I'll be let to work on our own place. Repetition of that wee phrase. It's so sad because it's it's so close to them, but we know that, that it's not going to happen. This little section is important because it shows how Candy understands what the future will hold for him if he if he doesn't find an escape he speaks miserably um you've seen what they done to my dog tonight they says he was no good to himself nor anyone else when they can me here i wish somebody would shoot me so he understands the parallel between the way they treated his dog and the way they'll treat him and what he understands is that he has no future that there there is no hope to be offered in the situation that he's currently in the only hope that he has is that he can connect with George and Lenny and that they can accept him and he says but they won't do nothing like that I won't have no place to go and I can't get no more jobs so he knows how limited his potential is he won't have no place to go he can't get no more jobs he has no value that this is a society that only places a value on the on you know the economic potential of a human being of what they can do to serve or what they can do in order to create a profit for somebody else and candy realizes that he he can't do any of those things so that once he gets canned he'll be no good to to um to the the boss or other ranchmen and therefore he'll be lost he'll have nowhere to belong so i suppose in relation to the three men involved in the dream candy is the one who needs it more than anyone else and he is the one who can offer george and lenny that financial foothold to to fulfill that dream so there's a real pathos here there's a real pity and sadness to be felt in the idea that candy understands his situation um you know when we first met candy we saw him perhaps as as the gossip um, we understood the delight that he took in, in gossiping about Curly's wife and we can make a judgment based on that but really when we when we think about what Candy knows about himself and his own situation we, we understand that that gossiping figure is only a way of, of, of trying to, to have a role trying to, to be somebody in this particular ranch to be something that um, other people will notice because he realises that he has no value um, and therefore he will have no hope. The dream means so much to him because it can offer him some place to go. Also to, in what Candy says, we can perhaps see how it foreshadows futures, uh, future events. He said, um, um, I wish somebody had shoot me. I wish there'd be somebody there to, to take me out of my misery, to put me out of my misery. Um, and that will will come to fruition in section six, as we'll see. But the key thing here is we see the, the pity of Candy and how George and Lenny can offer him something that, that he deeply desires, a place to go. 
okay, so George then, he stands up and he says, we'll do her, we'll fix up that old place and we'll go live there. Um, and they all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of the thing. Each mind was popped into the future where this lovely thing would come about. So the idea that each one of them is lost in the dream and it's their own personal idea of the dream, their own personal idea, idea of what the dream means to them. So George is lost in this sense of, of autonomy. Candy is lost in this idea that he'll have a home and Lenny is lost in the idea of the rabbits. And George says, wonderingly, now remember how his eyes were full of wonder. And here we have the repetition of, of that word here in its adverb form. Suppose there was a carnival or a circus or a town or any damn thing and they could just go to it. So it's n now it's that idea of self-sufficiency and that idea of, ju of autonomy, being able just to decide what you want to do. If you want to go and enjoy yourself at something like a carnival or they can go do that thing. So it's not just about self-sufficiency now, but it's that idea of being in charge of your own destiny, being able to, to take pleasure in, the, in the, the idea that you're in charge of your own world. But what you have is reality crashing in. Voices were approaching from outside. So George speaks quickly now. Don't tell anybody about it. Just us three and nobody else. And so that idea that he has to back, go back to his defensive mode and the idea that the voices, the voices were approaching from outside, inside that ranch house, the dream was alive and well. It had potential. They could feel it. It was almost, you know, palpable. It was something there that, that they were on the threshold of achieving. But outside reality, when reality comes into that room, we're going to see how far removed that dream can be from, from where it was uh, in that little middle section of section three. Because it's the reality that other people bring in from outside that that unfortunately is going to affect it so negatively and there we have um the idea that all of a sudden we'll get our pay and scram out of here lenny and candy nodded and they were grinning in delight and that grinning delight is so important because it's lenny's grin it's the smile it's the legacy of the dream that's going to take us on the, those first negative steps um away away from it of what from achieving it don't tell anybody, Lenny said to himself. And that idea that, that George needs to needs to strategically um defend the dream, issue instructions, tell the men what they're what they have to do, they have to keep it safe, they have to keep it safe and let it live for as long as they can. And this final little section on the dream, what we have here is a is an interesting uh, repetition because in section three at the very start George recognised when he looked into Slim's godlike eyes that there was a, a level of connection there, an emotional human connection with Slim. He understood that Slim would listen to him without judging him. And so George made that confessional um, declaration to, to Slim where he told him about how he had exploited Lenny's vulnerability and how he would never do anything like that again. And then Candy looks to George in exactly the same manner. Candy sees within George a connection, a human connection. And Candy confesses his shame too, that he should have shot the dog himself. That he he feels guilty because he didn't live up to um, his responsibility and he didn't do the right thing. That he was, he was too weak to do the right thing when it counted. And... When Candy says that to George, not only is he connecting with George and, and making it clear that, that Candy respects George, but he's also sharing part of himself with George. Because it's through sharing, it's through connecting, it's through this collective of, of individuals working together um, that the dream can happen. And Candy feels the need that to, to speak and to connect with George. Because he sees him now, not as a stranger, but as, as a friend, as somebody who he can trust and rely on. And they believe that, that together, the three of them, they can make this wonderful thing happen.